have you ever thought if social scientists could do practical real life work? Have you ever wondered if there's such a thing as true employment in our field? Welcome to the prerequisite quantitative methods, which we are going to do just that. Learn real practical skills for tomorrow, life, your career, whatever. Of course, I'm not a uh, postmodernist, I cannot teach you if a spoon in reality is a subject or something similar, things like that. I'm going to teach you the most basic practical skills what you're going to use in a quantitative methods course. Hi, my name is Sesa Karonen. I'm a project researcher here at the University of Turku. I'm going to tell about me a little bit soon more, but let's just step right in. Okay. The course is intensive course designed to provide foundation in quantitative research methods and of course for your future in other courses which are going to be more demanding. But this is a refresher course to get you up to speed, so to speak, if you haven't been uh, learning these kind of stats for a while or there is some kind of a lack of knowledge in certain kind of basic areas. This is a refresher course and this is going to be laid out the foundation for the rest of the courses what you're going to be studying on. Okay, so the course is split into four days and this is the basic structure of this. With each day after that is going to be also a demo which is basically exercises for the Excel. But first we are going to have the lecture which is going to be uh, give you the foundation and ideas what we are going to do in a practical manner after that. So first we have theory and then we have the practical side of it. But the first day is going to be a little bit different because we are going to just have the lecture and that is a little bit more hefty lecture than the other ones. They are going to be much shorter because there is just a really hyper focused on one thing. And the first day is of course introduction to statistical inference. We are going to go through uh, basic statistic or how do you think in statistic brain, so to speak, how, how you are going to be understanding what is statistical research. That is the basic block you have to understand first beforehand. We are going to load up the weapons and start firing rounds on the statistical field. And the second day is going to be key figures. What is mean? What is median? What is a mode? What is whatever the hell, you know, the basic understanding and what's the terminal odds and how you calculate the basic building blocks of statistical uh, calculations. So if you know mean and the standard deviation, you're going to go far. You're probably going to be able to calculate the most uh, uh, complex models with that information alone because they are based on those. So understanding the basic building blocks are going to truly help you to understand more complicated matters as well. And the third day is going to be more complicated. It's cross tabulation and three-way cross tabulation with elaboration. So there is going to be a little bit more statistical thinking here in relevant to the actual method what we are going to utilize here. And finally, we have the fourth day, which is the test of significance and correlations. And the correlations are the basic uh, building block to understand regression analysis, which you are going to do a lot after this course. But here, the most important thing is just to understand what is correlations and what is correlation versus causation and understanding these basic issues. And for the creating of this course, this is going to be quite straightforward. You are going to be doing a survey study, which is end of this course. You can do it in pairs if you like to, or if you do alone, if you prefer. But uh, you can see the file survey study instructions file for more information in the Moodle page. And to be done, the three exercises during and after the demo sessions are not evaluated. I'm not going to elaborate those. This, those are just for you. You have to do those to understand how to do the survey study. That is going to be the main exercise which you are going to be uh, not graded in a way because it's an evaluation case. You're going to pass or fail, but you have to pass. So you have to understand what these things are. These are not that complicated issues, what we are going to calculate here. So to do the survey study right, 
you have to do the exercises as well, but I'm not going to create those. So just focus on that you understand the underlying issues here and the survey study is going through like a breeze. It's going to be easy, trust me. And for the statistical software, we are going to use Microsoft Excel. You can use LibreOffice or something like that, but I'm not going to be uh, the technical expert here and provide you help with that. You have to find your own solutions for that. This is not an Excel course or any statistical program course. So if you are out of the loop totally, I have provided you several uh, YouTube videos, which you can watch to get the refresher how the program basics works. We are going to have a little bit of that in one of the demos, but not that much, because I have to assume you have had this skill somewhere along the line of your education beforehand. And then we have this specialized exam, what you can do, which is basically, if you think this is totally horseshit, this is totally easy for me, I understand everything, I'm a god with Excel, I know everything about statistics, then you can take the skip this course exam, exam found in the Moodle, and you have to send it to me with an email, and I'm going to evaluate it if you can skip the course. But to be fair, just, just note this, please don't send me that exam if you don't know jack shit, so to speak, because that will just waste my time and your time also by doing that exam without any reason whatsoever. But if you are confident that you know these issues and you can answer to those questions, that's more easier than to sit through the whole course and do that. Please free, send it to me and I'm going to grade it and you're going to pass or fail it. And that's what. So don't be afraid of sending it out for me, but don't do it for the wrong reasons. And next up we have several links here, which are Excel tutorials. And they're YouTube tutorials, they're basically quite okay tutorials. I recommend watching those if you don't know what the hell is going on. They're quite slow paced and easy to understand, so I can recommend them as those wholeheartedly if you don't have any idea what is going on in the demos. So watch those then in that case. Otherwise, if you have basic skills of Excel, you're going to be probably just fine. Okay, and the question is, who is this stupid face here? That's my face. So it's bound to be looking a little bit stupid. But my name is Esa Karonen, I'm a project researcher in the University of Turku, like I said uh, in the beginning of this lecture. And I work in a Beyond 4.0 project, which is funded by the European Union Horizon 2020 program. I'm also a doctoral candidate in Invest Flagship program, and now it's basically own research unit. And I was in a TITA consortium, which ended literally uh, three days ago. So I'm academically a little bit confused, but that's totally normal in this line of business. And my research interests are basically economic inequality, which is income, consumption and wealth differences, economic asymmetry, if you want to be economist and use that term. And there is also like generational differences and also an interest in criminology and simulation models. And methods that I use are usually multi-level models, age period and cohort models, which are quite familiar to me because I have two research papers published on that and micro simulation models and the agent-based models also and machine learning things which I dabble in. I'm not a master on those but I try to do a little bit more high level stuff. At least try to learn. These are really complicated but you know you're probably going to be better than me someday and this is the first step of course. But anyways, and my dissertation, dissertation uh, that's really hard word, but it's economic cycles and changes in economic inequality over life cycle. That's the working title, which is bound to change probably. And my upper secondary mathematics grade, which is basically a uh, uh, high school in the United States. Let's just say that's most easier to understand. It was C from short mathematics. C is basically uh, okay value, it's not that great. Like, like the Chernobyl TV series, not great, not terrible. 
But the point here why I did put there that is that you don't have to be genius to do statistics. You have to be just uh, mindful of things and learn the basics and use those basics well. And the information is going to accumulate. Science isn't something that you have to be genius in. You just have to make right choices when you're conducting research and be really thinking what you want to do with what tools you have. So it's not that complicated. If you have well thought out uh, research like uh, framework, you're going to do just fine. So don't worry about it. What I'm trying to say here, I'm a mediocre person. I came from a family of uh, construction workers and stuff like this, so working class family. I'm not a genius, but I'm doing PhD and doing just fine. And you are probably going to do a much better job than I am going to do. <laughs> but enough bullshit, let's go to the first day just here. So let's start with a small question. Why do science? So have you ever had an opinion which you thought to be true, but in reality was based on a personal bias or lack of information? And of course, for that I could say, have you ever been on a Twitter? Then you understand that everyone will do this shit. They don't know what they're talking about. They have some kind of internal biases and, and going to make some not so reasonable assessment on things. But people usually like to think that they have infallible like reasoning skills, but that's of course not true. But don't worry, we have science to do less wrong. And of course, because we are doing statistical course, we have to think also why to do statistical analysis. The question is how to get from armchair reasoning to statistical and empirical research. And previously, as we talked about the people's internal biases and stuff like this, we have so-called the good old common sense, which suffers from selectivity. For example, here in the Brixer, People usually like to think, for example, hey, my friends are thinking this and that. They are going to uh, have some kind of an effect on your opinions. And maybe you have some kind of a role model which you like. And you're going to absorb those thoughts in yourself. For example, you may have some person you are adamant on watching on Twitch in a political realm. And you think, hey, this is kind of cool doodle cow and has some interesting ideas. And maybe you are going to absorb those ideas for yourself and there is some kind of a community you want to appease in. But the whole point here is that people do have internal biases and are not uh, really good at making decisions and understanding things in a systematic way. You probably know someone or maybe recognize from yourself that there is some selection going on. And the selective observer in the previous slide does make the mistake of generalizing his or her observations to apply everyone. One example could be you are walking down the street and you're going to see youngsters wearing a punk-esque clothing and they're a little bit loud. Maybe you're going to have some kind of uh, mental image that punk people are a little bit anarchistic and really loud and drink booze or something like that. But you have only one sample, you have seen only this one group. It is really easy to assert this kind of a thought process for the whole group. So they are going to represent everyone on that group for you. So this is the indiscriminate observation and the bias because you only have one sample of from this group. So you are not going to uh, be able to do that kind of a generalizing. And to sound more scientific, the sampling frame doesn't cover the whole population and the population being all the people in the punk culture. Of course, we have a scientific solution for this. So when you're generalizing information, you will require, require that everyone is interviewed to find out some kind of quality from them, which is kind of rare because you are not going to be, let's just say, interview every Finnish person on this country, it's usually not realistic. Or maybe you do observations in a systematic way, which can be relied to represent all. For example, if you interview certain kind of a people in a subculture, for example, let's just say the punk people, you are bound to have in some point 
answers which are going to be repeated and there is going to be the saturation point. So you can say that certain amount of people will represent pretty well the whole vast generalized punk culture. So that's one way, but you have to do it really systematic way. Now, everything what I said, it's not just limited to statistical research, but uh, it's critical to all research and rational thought itself. Even if the observation differs from the systematic observation, and usually it like, deviates from that, we should be aware that it's possible for bias in association with this. So the uh, systematic research approach is a requirement in order to generalize research results for the large number of people. You have to be really critical when you're doing this, but understand that there is always some kind of a statistical error or a possibility for error behind this, because we are doing a generalization. But let's go a little bit back, because this is also important. What is the idea of empirical research. Let's just not think statistical reasoning just yet. Let's just think what is science itself? How, how we process things? Because this is what research is. It starts from this point on. This whole scientific process will start when we are going to ask some kind of a research question and we are going to answer to that question by observing certain kind of observations. For example, we could question that is people's income higher if they have higher educational level, if they have more educational years? And that's quite a basic question, but from here point on we can make hypotheses which are basically inductions from observations. If we see that, okay, those people are quite educated and they have seem to have more income than the persons who don't have that much of education, that could be a basis for research and we are bound to have to uh, form a hypothesis for that. For, for example, the hypothesis could be that uh, people who have more education also have more income on average. And this could be based that we have observations and things seem to be like this or rationally follow to each other, but we have to do uh, empirical research and systematic research to find if this is true or not. And then we are going to test this hypothesis with an experiment. We are bound to have some kind of a study methodology or data set or whatever it is, but we have to test the hypothesis if it's true or not. And depending on the results, we have to modify the research hypothesis if that didn't bring a satisfactory answer, or maybe there did came up something during the research that requires that we modify the uh, research hypothesis to gain more information, or maybe the research hypothesis is eliminated, or to be more precise, falsified. And of course, the research hypothesis could be just true. Whatever it is, after that we are going to report the conclusions in scientific journal and yada yada. But the main point here is that the scientific research is bound to have these kind of steps, regardless uh, which branch of the science we are operating in. And next off, of course, we have to talk about statistics. And the so-called statistical inference is a process of using data analysis to deduce the properties of underlying distributions of probability. Of course, now you think what, what the hell this guy is saying. So, the inference on statistic analysis I'm to deduce properties from population, for example, testing hypotheses or deriving estimates. So we have certain kind of uh, answers to our questions. So these quantitative branches are called descriptive research and explanatory research. Those are two branches of uh, uh, statistical analysis, which we can call them. But not to be so technical, let's we go a little bit back. What this all means that we have certain kind of a representative group which we are going to gather some data and we are going to use that data to make generalizations by doing estimates of that. So we are estimating that these kind of things would be representative for the larger population of that group we are interested on. And still to be more precise for the first sentence here, when we are deducing properties of underlying distribution of probability, what I mean is that 
from the sample we make a for example observation that hey punk people do like Dr. Martin boots more often than the general population so there is an um, probability that these people like them more so we are measuring probabilities here it's not set in stone it's more probable in compared to this group for example so that's the most easiest understanding to make here for example if we are going to make an estimate it's an estimate it's bound to have some kind of a margin of error, of course. It's not that precise, but it's precise enough. To, and that's the point, to make precise enough so we can make generalizations. So the generalization is really probable that this will be true in that larger population. Now, the quantitative social sciences can be divided in two main categories. First, we have uh, descriptive research, which is pretty straightforward. The name will uh, tell it what it is. When you want to describe certain phenomenon or data, you make certain kind of averages and observations of that data. And it can be data descriptions, not that generalized for the population, or statistical reasoning, which is a generalization of the results to the whole population. And one of these questions could be how many percent of Finns have basic education or how many children do Finns have on average. These are like observations of that group. And then we have the explanatory research when we want to estimate whether something is related to another thing or phenomenon. Now we are not just observing certain kind of things. Now we are relating things to each other. And this is always based on statistical reasoning. For example, the aim is uh, to generalize the research to whole population. And here comes the really, really important one. Uh, the explanatory analysis are usually correlations. So we have to talk about correlations and not effects. We are say, say that some things are associated with each other. So these two uh, phenomena are not related in a cause and effect fashion. But we are going to talk about this more later on. But one example of the explanatory research is going to be the question of, for example, uh, is the income of the parents related to the length of the child's education or is the employment related to the number of children or the fertility in Finland? So there is more things going on because the descriptive research was just how many percent of Finns have perished education. This is really simplistic data point. It's observation. Okay, this many people have basic education in Finland. But now when we are asking questions, for example, is the unemployment related to number of children in Finland? So there is a uh, two basic building blocks which are associated with each other, which we are interested on. For example, here there's unemployment. Is it related to the number of children? Or maybe the number of children is related to unemployment. It can go both ways. But that's the research question. It's more complicated when you are explaining something with something. Something is associated with something and descriptive research is just that we are making straight on observations. Okay, let's have a more practical example. Let's just say we are interested how tall people are in certain cities. So we are going to do descriptive research here. It would be unwise to go around and try to ask hundreds and or thousands of people of their height or try to observe the random people on the streets as you are just one person. You, you cannot observe everyone in that city. Instead, we can gather representative sample of the population. Like we talked before, we must have gather some, in some systematic way enough people so we can make some kind of uh, estimate how tall people are in that given city. And here we have a visualized example. There is a row of people and they are ordered with the height, by the height. So all statistics in essence are just distribution of observations. So the distribution here is of course people in the height rates and the observation is each given person in that row. 
And now because people have been ordered by their height and we know how many people are at certain height, we can estimate the average height of this group. And we have to assume here that our sample of people represents the population of city correctly. So we can assume that this estimation is also what reflects what is true among the whole population or the every citizen of that given city. So we have to have great sample to make this kind of a estimation. But let's just assume that we have an okay sample here. Now there is a distribution of people now here, as you can see from the graph. And in the middle part, part there, the largest number of people at this given height, the hump is the largest at that point, and we can draw from that point's point downwards, and we can see that 170 centimeters in this given sample is the mean height of all people. So this is what we can call descriptive analysis. We made an estimation of a people's height among general population. And the explanatory analysis would instead consider if there is a link between several variables. For example, uh, is calorie intake associated with height? Are genetics associated with height? Thus, we would search an explanation for the variation why people's height vary. And that is the, in a nutshell, what is the descriptive analysis and explanatory analysis in a practical sense. Now, of course, you think, okay, that's it. I can go make science and be rich and have a Nobel Prize. How about no? We have still miles to go here. So we cannot just go and measure everything what we like to measure. So we have to, have you ever heard the phrase correlation does not equal causation? And here's some examples. For this graph, we have a number of people who have drowned by falling in the pool, and it correlates with the uh, films which Nicholas Gates has been appeared on, and the correlation is 66%. So with the statistic, we have been really mindful about also what we are measuring and if these things are correlated with each other. When you think about it, like the question that if people's height is associated with the calorie intake, we have previous information that that is totally true. One simple example would be uh, North and South Korea. For example, in South Korea, there is usually a little bit problem with the famine and stuff like this. And we have the South Korea, which is really well off country. So people are bound to have a greater calorie intake than in the North Korea. And when we compare the uh, median or uh, like the mean heights of that country, the North Korea is bound to have a little bit shorter people because of the calorie deficit. So the environmental issues, what these countries differ and have, will associate with the height pretty logically. But here, when we think about the number of people drawn by falling in the pool and the films Nicholas Gates has been appeared on, there is bound to be some kind of a logical leap here that maybe these things are not that associated with. Like in similar fashion, here is a total revenue generated by arcades and it correlates almost perfectly with computer science doctorates awarded in the United States. Of course, this is a little more plausible if we would stretch our minds so, so, so long and think about that, yeah, maybe people who are in computer science do love arcades also. At least in the 80s when the arcades were popular, maybe there is a correlation that it would be inspired. No, no, that that's cause a little bit sociological bullshit. Of course, you could examine that in a scientific way, but let's just say there is probably more plausible reasons. And here again, another example, which is the great classic, which is the ice cream sales and shark attacks, which basically correlate perfectly. But here the explanation is, of course, that the in July, people will buy more ice cream and, and hang out in the beaches. So it's logical follows when people are more at the beaches, they will buy ice cream because it's hot and because it's hot, they're at the beach and they want to go to the water and in the water, there are sharks. So there you go. That's the explanation. It has nothing to do with ice cream or shark attacks. There is definitely not causation in this. There is a correlation, but you have to be mindful about this when doing research. What are your research questions and what things are associated with each other?
So to come to some kind of a conclusion here on this tangent, it's important that while causation and correlation can exist at the same time, the correlation does not imply causation. And the causation explicitly applies to the cases where the action A causes outcome B. There is direct uh, effect on each other. So, in other hand, the correlation is simply a relationship. It, it's not a cause of anything. So, action A relates to action B, but one event doesn't necessarily cause the other event to be happening. And these things are usually confounded and confused really often because human mind likes to find patterns even when they do not exist. For example, going back, people see punk people being loud. Okay, all punk people are loud. People make stupid assumptions on really small issues. And we even fabricate this thing in our minds and start to expand this story that something is true while it isn't not. There is only a correlation, not causation. And to really hone this scrap in, because this is important, so I have seen that many students will confound these issues and you are bound to make mistakes if you haven't been thinking about this. Because if you're writing a thesis, it's so easy to say that there is some kind of a causation because you are using word effect, for example. Effect means there is a cause and effect on something and not association. You, you just have to mold your brain right now to that. If you are having a correlative study, you are saying association, not causation. And let's just say 90% of cases, you are doing correlative research. So again, correlation happens between variables. And variable is, of course, uh, something that varies. It will be the ice cream eating, weather, Nicholas Cage's appearance in movies, there are all variables, those things vary. Nicholas Cage has been in X amount of movies in 2015 and X amount of movies in 2020. There's a different amount of movies. It's a variable. It varies. And usually you eat more ice cream in July, for example. But the thing here is that it doesn't automatically mean that the change in one variable is the cause of the change in the values of the other variable. And causation, of course, indicates that one event is the result of the occurrence of the other event. So there is a causal relationship with the two events. And again, a little bit repetition, but the intensity example where we measure the people's height, the 170 centimeters, is descriptive observation. And the explanatory analysis would instead consider there is a link between several variables, like I say, the calorie intake thing. But then again, there is also causal or correlative factors linked to the height, which we have to take account. So which kind of an argument we are making? Are we making a causal argument or a correlative argument? And from the causal argument, the uh, requirements to do so is much higher. You have to do special kind of research for that and really true out research. But we are going to talk about a little bit more about that later as it implies doing experiments. Okay, let's go for the terminology here because we did use some kind of words in the description what we previously go through. But as we know now the basic gist of the doing research, but now the question is of course what terms are. So let's go through some basic concepts which help us to understand statistics. And those are observation cases, or so to speak cases, population sample variable observation matrix. And we can catch up this rest as they come along on these presentations. Okay, first up, the most easiest one, cases. So what are cases? Cases can be persons, countries, companies, Basically anything that is subject or an object of the research. For example, individual or a household could be an observation unit. And here on the picture you can see that the one individual is just one person. Of course, what the name implies. Or the household, it could be, let's just say that's a family. In that household is a three-person family. So it's that simple. One case is also one object of the research. It could be a person or maybe a model of the car. There is one case of this car or 20 cases of this car, certain kind of car. 
So it's that simple. It's basic unit of statistics. And next up is the population and sample. And the population is a so-called target population uh, from which the study seeks to draw a conclusion. The population could be, like we talk about, the punk community as a whole, in, for example, in Finland. What is the punk population in Finland? So we have to measure that, and usually we cannot uh, interview every one of those persons and collect our data sets. So uh, we have to take a sample from that pool of population. And this sample is usually randomly picked, which means that the set amount of observation units are randomly selected from that set population. We usually do the statistical sets to test the validity, to how well the sample selection has been performed. So if our sample is bad, our results are bad also. It doesn't represent the population. And now comes one of the big ones. So what is a variable? Like I previously stated already, variable is something to be measured. And this could be gender, education, income, number of times Nicholas Cage has appeared in movies. And basically it is an any measurable thing that gets different values. So variable means something varies. Okay, it's variable. Wow, who would have thought? And these are usually coded in num numeric form, which could be, for example, all females get one and males get zeros. There is also examples here on the right side. These are pretty self-explanatory, but I have heard that some students do forget what is a variable after this lecture series. So let's be a little bit anal here. So maybe you remember this more easily. Let's think about this in practical manner. You, yes, you, dear listener, you are the variable right now. Here, for example, let me make an assumption here. You are somewhere around age 25. You have student credits of worth of, um, let's just say, 120. Your faculty could be stated as four. Let's just say four stands for social policy. And your number of minutes on a mobile phone on this course is 125 minutes on average. And now, let's see this. All the green things here are a variable. It could be age. Age varies between you and you students. The number of credits will vary. Faculty will vary. Number of minutes on a mobile phone will vary. Maybe some people are not Zoomers who will live on the phone. Maybe you will have little miss more age and the age value goes down. <laughs> But then again, the values are the numbers here, what I have stated. So we have values for the variable. Now, do you remember which is which? And the, remember, variable is just something that varies. It can be anything. And now, hopefully, you remember in the next course, so Patricia McMullin doesn't say that these students won't remember what a variable is. Hopefully, she will be happy. Now, finally, the observation matrix. This is just a set of values arranged in rows and columns to be analyzed. And this is basically how all statistical programs present their data. In simplistic fashion, each observation unit is in its own row. So we have the values there and each variable is it is in its own column. So the column Basically, the first values are usually the names, and then you get all the values under it. It is that simple, and it will become pretty obvious when you are using Excel and a little bit doing data management and doing some calculations. Let's talk about random sampling for a moment. Like I said, that it is really important to have a great sample when you're doing generalization from the base data set, which is the whole population, basically. And we are often interested in the sign of certain characteristics, for example, income level, education, etc., etc., in the population. But we don't want to ask about the income of every age because we have 5.5 million Finnish people here. So for generalizing these things, we require a random sampling. And randomness here is when sampled, uh, the members of the population have predetermined probability of 
being sampled because we want to have, um, for example, if we are measuring education, we have to have certain kind of uh, sensitivity to the different areas because in different areas there is a different amount of people. So we have to have a representative sample of each area, etc., etc., etc. Like I previously stated, statistical reason is basically understanding probabilities and with probabilities there is also uncertainties and these uncertainties are also expressed in probabilities. So what does this mean? The answer to the research question can only be approached with certain kind of a probability. So we are not going to have certain answer. Like in the example with people's height in certain city, the let's just say 170 centimeters, it's an estimation. It's certain probability that people will drop in this height. And what that means, the height is probably more likely to be around that area. It's not accurate, totally accurate information. It's a probability estimation of that the people will be at that height. And this probability can be expressed as a numerical value between or 0 to 1. So we can say that certain kind of a phenomenon occurs at the probability is 0 0.25, which translates as phenomenon occurs in 25% of all cases. And more clearly, 20 out of 100 participants in the course will have a red shirt, for example. Or maybe 25 out of 100 participants will fail the course. Hopefully not. <laughs> but the idea of the reasoning here is that what do the randomly selected cases tell us about the whole population? And as I said that the aim is to estimate population's parameters from the sample. So of course the question is what is the parameter? The parameter is something that the population has, the whole, like the whole data set of people which is the actual Finnish population. So it could be mean height of the total Finnish population. But in the sample we have estimation of the mean height for the Finnish population. So we have estimation which is a educated guess if we want to say that rawly. So in general in research we are interested of course the values of the population which are just estimations or tested through the representative sample. And like I said, we can test what is the mean of the sample and we are going to have a generalization that this is the mean height of the Finnish people. So let's go a little bit more in depth here. So the main rationale here is that the sample is used to calculate or estimate the mean and to estimate the standard error, because we are bound to have a little bit errors here, because it's just a sample, it's not the real deal. And basically what we are doing, that the information is used to estimate where the mean of the population is likely to be, so a probability. And in the picture you can see there is the population distribute, the which is the distribution of the true population, and we have the sample distribution here, which is more or less representative, and we have the interval estimator, which is the population mean based on the sample. So we have a range of the es estimation that where the mean will be likely to be. So we have a probability where the mean is. So we bound to have a little bit also measurement error because we don't have the exact number but we have the ballpark estimate that yes, this is the number that which is the mean height of the population. And what is basically happening here, we have the example picture here on the left. Again, using the height example, there is the three samples, which is the red distribution and the true population distribution with blue. So we are making an estimation with the three red samples or the red distributions to gain knowledge that what is likely to be the mean height in a total population? This is what we are doing. We are doing a most probable calculation on the estimation about the 
mean height. Now let's go forward because now we previously talked about we are making an estimation of things but we have to have some kind of idea what we are estimating. So usually that means as you probably remember, remember from the uh, beginning of this lecture there were hypotheses. So we are going to test some hypotheses. So what is hypothesis? What is the certain idea behind of this whole thing? So first of all, we have a null hypothesis. In a nutshell, you could think that null hypothesis is something that if you want to observe if something happens, the null hypothesis will be always that nothing happens. That's the baseline. Nothing funky is happening. For example, is years of education in uh, association with income? Of course, you would think, of course it is, because more, more education, more income, but null hypothesis whole point is, there is no association. That is always the zero point, nothing happens. And your hypothesis, of course, is the alternative hypothesis, which means that something happens. So you can remember this pretty easily, null, null what it the name implies, nothing, nothing happens, there is nothing going on, and the alternate hypothesis, usually which we are interested in research, there is some kind of an effect or association between the variables. So, to be more precise, null hypothesis could be formally stated that the, uh, there is no association between two variables which are the interest of the research. And the alternative hypothesis is simply that there are association between the variables. And now when we know that what we are researching on, we have to choose the right statistical test and certain kind of a questions, problems, and what we want to strive to uh, gain information on, we have to choose test of probability that will measure that how probable is that null hypothesis happening, that nothing happens. So what is the amount of risk we are willing to accept? Usually it's the uh, 5% risk level, which does mean that we are willing to accept that there is a 5% risk for the null hypothesis happening, that exactly there is no uh, differences between the groups which we are measuring all the variables. To be in a nutshell, what I mean that we accept that the, there is a 5% probability that our, our estimations are going to be bullshit, basically. Then, when we have decided this, we are going to do the statistical test. After the test, we are going to get the results and we have to make a decision if we abandon or accept the null hypothesis. Decision on validating or invalidating the null hypothesis or in a simple manner is there's association between the variables. The idea here, if the statistical test is smaller than the chosen risk level, which was the 5%, the null hypothesis is invalidated and the alternative, alternative hypothesis is validated. So there is an association between variables. So that is what we are bound to do in statistical testing. So now let's go more in depth on a practical level, but with a simplistic example. And let's make an causal thing here, because we talked previously what is causality and what is uh, uh, correlative research, but let's start with uh, causal links here. So here is the basic experiment. So the question is how do you find causal links between variables? How this would be tested? And this analog will be useful for you also because this is how statistical testing basically works. So in this scenario where we are measuring that does watering plants have an effect for the uh, sprout growth? So the idea here is we have to control all the variables in the laboratory environment so we can introduce new variable and measure its effect because there is no confounding variable. So there is nothing that will affect the plant growth, only what we are going to introduce that experiment. So we are having an independent variable which is amount of water and we are having a control group which are not going to get any water and an experimental group which are going to get water. So the water itself is a treatment here in the testing. 
And the idea is we can compare the effect of water by observing the differences between the control group and the experimental group. And in this example, you can see that the experimental group has sprouts and the control groups does not have that. That means that the null hypothesis is invalid and the alternate hypothesis in, in effect. There is an association between amount of water and sprouts growth. And here comes the thing about the causality. If this same experiment is replicated multiple times and we can be surely say that all possible variables are controlled and then we can state that the water has causal effect on sprout growth. And the thing here is that of course in social sciences we cannot put universe in a laboratory Thus, usually the correlative research can be only compromised in this situation because we cannot be totally sure how different variables will affect that because life itself is a confounding variable. There is so much thing going on. There are certain kind of uh, natural ex experiments or uh, for let's just say genetical research in social scientists that can uh, twin studies which can be associated with causality but usually it's really really hard but they are they can be done but usually that's why we don't have that much of uh, uh, causal research and one example of this is the um, the hate what we previously mentioned uh, we cannot reduce individuals calorie intake by force for decades to measure its effect on hate it would be quite unethical when you think about that. But then again, the experiments are the gold standard as we should seek to control all variables to gain most causal explanation possible. So you should strive that every time. But of course, you have to make compromises because that's the reality. We can do similar kind of experiments that, for example, physics can do. And here is one important thing also. Note the language on the hypothesis. There is association with implies the correlation between variables and the effect which is, implies causality. So when you are writing your thesis or any research related paper, remember to use these words really right. Although we are not qualitative researchers who are really like uh, my, have minute detail and sensitivity to language, in quantitative research, these two words are totally important because you can get sacked by a research journal, by the referees, because they will say that why you are using causal language on your paper and you are bound to get a little bit trouble there. So remember this, association, correlations, effect, causality. Use those and you are golden. So next up, and the final thing today is the levels of measurement. Like we previously talked about variables, we have different kind of variables. There is some kind of a classifications which will have a distinct flavor of the variable, what it is. Uh, for first of all, we have categorical variables and second uh, large group is the continuous variables. And the categorical variables are usually uh, basically classifications or memberships or certain kind of a level, for example, education level is a categorical variable. Of course, if you're having a basic education, if you're having second education or a tertiary education, two are all levels which can be compared. And continuous variable would be, for example, income. It starts from zero and goes up indefinitely. If you are Elon Musk, you are bound to have really big number there. Then again, education again, uh, we can think that as uh, years of education, that's a continuous variable. So you have measurement in years, how much you have education and not an educational level, which is a category. But first up, let's go to the categorical variables and the nominal scales. And basically what it is, it's a divides observational unit in the groups according to the features. And the most classic one is gender or sex. Are you male or female? Uh, what is the color of your hair? Is brown, black, blonde, gray or other? Uh, where do you live? North of the equator. Uh, what city do you live on? So this is kind of straightforward actually. 
and in comparison, like the nominal scale was just a certain kind of observations of something. Ordinal scale is an observations that can be ranked. They are somehow distinct of each other in this way. So, for example, the question, how do you feel today? Very unhappy, unhappy, okay, happy, very happy. It's a Likert scale, which goes from the one to five. Or maybe you watch movies and there is a, a movie rating from one to five. How many stars you can get the movie or how satisfied you are with uh, customer service. And there is um, some kind of scale for your attitude. How much did you like service itself? So all of these are categorization. They are just the classifications. And next up we have continuous variables, which like I said, is a rolling scales. It are scales. So first of all, is an interval scales. The values are regular intervals from each other. There is some kind of a difference affinity. For example, year of birth is good one. As anyone can have whatever year of birth. For example, some people have born in the 1920s, some people are 1990s, etc. etc. So there is no certain kind of a classification, it's just a number that stays the year. So it's an regular interval as one per year. And then we have the ratio scale, which can be described as specifying how much or how many of something. Uh, and usually it has a meaning from zero point. For example, money, you have income which is zero, you don't have any income, or just a number how much income you have. It's a magnitude, how, how much of something. So this is pretty simplistic way to understand it. And finally, what is interesting about these scales that the next viral type includes previous variable types conditions. For example, in nominal scale, there is a classification, just like in ordinary scales, but ordinary scale is just ranked classification. But it has the same conditions than the uh, nominal scale. And the same thing applies on the continuous variable. For example, interval scale, of course, uh, you have regular intervals also in the ratio scale, because if you have income, it's in euros. You want to have some kind of a sum on euros. It could be in cents or in other scale, for example, in people's heights, it's going to be centimeters and millimeters, etc. and etc. But the only difference is that the ratio has a zero point. For example, people's height, of course, you're bound to have some kind of a zero point, which is zero because you don't exist. <laughs> and from the income, zero income, of course. And, but in the interval scale, you don't have zero point because, for example, in the year of birth, you can have any year of birth because there is no limits to that. Maybe the creation of a universe and where the humanity did branch from the ape itself. And here we have it. This was the whole lecture today. There is quite a lot of stuff and these are the basics of statistical thinking, reasoning, uh, all in the same packets. I know this is quite a lot and hopefully everything was quite useful for you.